their special features. So check out Washington Gardener Magazine. And um, I also am the host of the Garden DC podcast. And we had a couple recent episodes on uh, edible gardening. The one we just taped last week is on Asian vegetables. So if you're in particular interest in Asian vegetables, I recommend going and listening to that um, podcast. And that's Garden DC. If you go on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast, you can just pull that up and listen to it for free. So this uh, is the first in our spring talk series that's going to take place on the first Wednesday of the month for Homestead Gardens. And Welcome everyone. So this one is sponsored by Homestead Gardens. And if you re pre-registered on Zoom, you should have got a handout with the um, uh, outline of this talk along with a shopping list from Homestead. Um, and those were things that I picked out that I think uh, beginning and intermediate and even some experienced gardeners might need for their garden uh, to start off well for cool season edible growing. So check out that shopping list and bring that with you next time you're at Homestead. And I'll try to point out a few things in this talk that are on that shopping list. So let's dive right in. So cool season edible gardening, pitched just for the mid-Atlantic region. So basically zone six, seven, a tiny bit of zone eight, a few of you, and um, a few of you in way Western Maryland might be even zone four or five but mainly zone six, seven is what we're talking about here. All right, so I'm gonna jump in. And the first part of the talk, we're gonna talk about growing basics, how to get started and where you're gonna be growing. Then the second part of the talk is about what you can grow in the cool season. And when I say cool seasons, I mean the shoulder seasons around our main summer growing season. So the cool season basically March, April into May and then again, September, October, November. So those are the two shoulder seasons we have in the mid-Atlantic. You can get some things to overwinter and we'll talk about those as well. Um, but mainly we, when we refer to cool season, we talk about those two shoulder seasons on each side of our very hot and humid summers. So first, where to garden? First, you want to get some space. So if you have ground available to you, uh, you want to make sure it is in full sun. Very few of the edibles that we're going to talk about today can take part shade or shade. If there are any that can take shade, I'll try to point those out to you. Uh, but most everything that is a fruiting plant, at least, or flowering needs full sun. Some things that are just grown for the foliage for the leaves, like lettuce or chives, could maybe take part sun to part shade. Um, I have a visiting kitty who's bugging me behind me. <laughs> so the next thing we want to look at for a growing site is the soil. So I highly recommend having a soil test done. And at Homestead Gardens at the information desk, you can pick up a soil kit, soil test kit, and have that sent in. Because you want to know first what was in that soil before you are growing. And this is Santino, by the way. Um, and he does love to garden, too. Um, so with the soil test, it's going to tell you, are there heavy metals in the soil, if there's other toxins, if it needs amending, and on the soil test, you want to put a note that says, this is for a vegetable garden, uh, because most soil test kits that are sent into the lab are for turf grass, for like a golf course or a playing field. So you want uh, results that are optimized for vegetable growing. And then you want to look at the layout of your plot. And when I say layout, I mean where is the sun? So the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, right? And we want our rows to go north, south. If you are in the northern hemisphere, which I believe everybody on this call is, uh, you want to go north, south so that you have the best air circulation around your beds and so that you have the greatest amount of sunshine in your garden plot and you're not having one bed shade another bed. Um, so sometimes we orient just the way we're like, that looks good that way, but definitely try to figure out on a uh, compass or uh, maybe even your iPhone can tell you which direction is north so that your rows are running due north south. And then on the raised beds, I use the French intensive method, uh, which doesn't have borders on the raised bed. And so that's the plot you see here um, where it's just mounded soil and um, that's perfectly fine. You could just mound soil and amend it. And then it, 
is a little bit easier for me, I find, to grow and weed around the edges. Or you can purchase a raised bed kit and have actual edges, borders. So those could be cedar wood, those could be brick, those could be a steel edge like the garden that's up on the upper right here has steel edge raised beds. Um, I find them to be really nice and neat looking and easier for beginners. So if you're just starting out, then you might want to go with the raised bed kit and do the neat edges. I am greedy for all the growing space I can get. And so that's why I do the French intensive method, which is basically as much as I can jam in a plot and those edges are taking up space that I want to grow in. All right, so let's jump into containers. So whether or not you have in-ground gardening space, you'll probably end up growing in containers as well. So in these two examples here, on the left is rooftop garden where they have grow bags and you can purchase grow bags at Homestead. They're like a thick black kind of fabric material, almost felty like feeling, but they do have drainage slits in the bottom and they do um, allow drainage while holding in soil. And then at the end of the season, you can just mulch the soil, put it, I mean, in a compost pile and then fold up the bags and store them for the winter time. So in here, uh, you might not be able to see quite as well, but towards the back on a raised bench, they have even more grow bags. And this is to increase drainage from where it's even sitting on the ground. And those are herbs and those grow bags to the back. And then the grow bags to the right are even some larger grow bags that have small shrubs in them like blueberries and raspberries. So you can basically grow anything in a grow bag. Um, and they're a great choice for edibles. They last about two to three growing seasons, I would say. So on the right is a, uh, large containers and these are about 24 inches in diameter and height and they are extruded plastic so that that pulled plastic molded and they're a great choice for growing edibles as well because terracotta can sometimes um, wick out the moisture and we'll talk about some of the herbs that might be better in terracotta the mediterranean herbs like being in terracotta but most everything else that you're going to want to grow um, wants to be in ceramic or plastic pots that don't wick away all the moisture from the soil. Um, so this is cut and come again lettuce. So you'll see on lettuce packets or in seed catalogs, it'll say heading lettuce or cut cutting lettuce. And in this case, they've sprinkled seeds for um, different varieties of cut and come again lettuce and in four different containers. So they've done them a couple weeks apart. So one container was done um, say this week and then in two weeks another one and two weeks another one and that way every week or so they can cut from one container and then move it to the back and then have the other one coming up and ready cut from that one move it to the back you can usually get I'm going to say three cuttings um, at least before the summer heat sets in and the plants bolt um, and for beginning gardeners a uh, plant bolts when it sends out a flower stem and starts to form flowers and go to seed. So that's what bolting means. And the lettuce is still edible when it's bolted, when it sends up that flower stem and seed, uh, but it usually sends all the energy of the plant into forming that flower stalk and then going to seed. That means the sugars have left the leaves and they're bitter at that point. So still edible, but not as sweet tasting, not as good tasting. And you might let some of those go to seed to collect seeds for next year. So it's not all is lost when your plants go uh, bolting uh, when the heat comes in. Um, I always leave a few of mine to gather up at that point. And I'll talk about one of my favorite plants to let bolt uh, later on in the second part of this talk. All right, so what to plant in? We talked about getting your soil test. Uh, next is to grow organically. A lot of us are growing our own edibles because we want to control what the soil is going to be, what was going to be in our edibles. So we have complete knowledge of what we're growing for ourselves and our family. And then I like to add into my growing beds about a third of composted material 
and that could be leaf grow and that's leaf grow gro with no w at the end that's bagged shredded and comp partially composted leaves and the other alternative to add in your mix is an animal manure so you can get bagged manures at homestead and those are usually like chicken manure rabbit manure we don't recommend as much anymore the horse and cattle manure goat okay <laughs> but um, you definitely want it to be uh, obviously um, a vegetarian animal but not, you couldn't use your pet's manure so to speak but you want to add it in the fall and then let it sit for the winter time when you mix it in because if you add straight manure from the bag they're so high in nitrogen sometimes that they can actually burn the leaves of some of your tender little seedlings so you usually want to mix it in in late fall early winter let it sit for a few months and then plant into it um, so in fertilizers, uh, most cool season edibles don't need fertilizing. Um, if anything, you might use a slow release fertilizer like Osmocote is one brand that I like. And that Osmocote are pelleted fertilizers that are covered with a little clay coating. They look like tiny little BBs. And those um, make sure you're getting the one that's rated for vegetable garden for edibles. And you can sprinkle that in the bed and as the clay decomposes it opens up the fertilizer and lets it go a little at a time and so you'll see on osmocote and other similar pelleted fertilizers that it'll say good for up to three months meaning it takes about three months for the pellet to dissolve um, so that's just one of the fertilizers that i like to use for for something that's like a leafy plant so when we're talking summer or hot season edibles, then you're gonna use more intense fertilizer. But for the cool seasons, just having amended soil, adding organic matter like the leaf grow, like animal manure is gonna be plenty of nutrients uh, for the edibles that you're growing. And then finally, soil temperature. So it's nice to have your own soil thermometer that you can insert into the soil and know when the soil is warm enough that seeds can germinate. Uh, but you can also go online and look at the weather service and also farmers websites that will tell you the soil temperature in your zip code is now at 50 degrees. And what you're looking for the magic number is usually about 55 for when you can start planting out when the, the soil is at consistently 55 or so degrees. Because uh, otherwise, when you're planting seeds in cold, cold soil, they just kind of sit there and they won't germinate until the soil warms up enough uh, to for them to get acclimated and open up and grow for you. So that's a great reason to know your soil temperature. And a lot of times on a seed pack, it might even say that for you. It might even say will germinate at soil temperature 65 degrees or needs to germinate at 75 degrees. And that's usually for people who are doing inside seed starting and might wanna use like a heating pad or something uh, to give their seeds um, warmer soil temperatures and a, a quicker start. But if you're going to be planting directly in the soil outside, you definitely wanna know that soil temperature there's an old fashioned way to know it and it's called the bare bottom test. And that's when farmers would put their little toddlers bare bottoms on the soil. And when they didn't jump up immediately because it was too cold to sit down on the soil, then you knew the soil was warm enough to plant your seeds. Um, so really, I think we don't need to subject our toddlers to do that anymore. I think we can just use one of those um, soil temperature websites or use a th soil thermometer or just dig in the soil a little bit and test it. Does it feel ice cold? Probably too cold. Um, in general, and I'm gonna give you some general dates now for planting, usually by St. Patrick's Day, which is March 17th, that is traditionally pea and potato planting time for our area. And that's in general when the soil temperatures have reached warm enough. And I emphasize in general because every year's weather patterns are different. We had those recent um, freeze thaws and ice storms that came through. So I think that's set us back a little bit. Maybe I might hedge this year and start planting 
uh, maybe by March 20th or so, maybe give it an extra couple more days. But I want to see how the weather is in the next few weeks and if we can get up to above average temperatures again. All right, let's jump into uh, insulation. So um, keeping that soil warm is important when you're going, especially from summer into fall. And so here is a cover cloth um, that we talked about earlier. And sometimes you'll see it under the brand name Remay, R-E-E-M-A-Y. And sometimes you'll see it called row cover or cover cloth. And it's just a spun fabric and it keeps insects out. It allows sunlight in, it allows um, the rain in, and it gives a little bit more insulation. So if you are say going to have a freeze or frost warning um, come through then I might throw a cover cloth like this over my beds and then pull it back in the morning. And other alternatives for insulation are a hoop house which is similar to what you see here with the, the metal hoops but it would be a thick plastic over the top but the plastic would never touch the plants themselves because sometimes where it touches the plants it can cost cause frost burn and frostbite. And then there's also, of course, the old fashioned cold frame, which you can create out of um, stacks of hay or bricks or make a wooden box and then put a window frame over it. And you're basically creating a mini greenhouse and you would just need to know that you need to vent that cold frame on sunny days so you don't cook what's inside the cold frame. Because um, even that one 60 degree day we had that great day today, but a few weeks ago we had a nice 60 degree day um, in February. And if you had that cold frame closed and had not vented it that day, you could have really damaged um, your edibles inside there. And so that's why I have that giant note saying, remember to vent. <laughs> so good thing to do is to set a phone alarm or um, other thing in your schedule to make sure you remember to go out and vent that cold frame every morning. Right, so other ways that we can insulate our cool season edibles um, should another ice storm or something else come through and you've already put your little broccoli seedlings outside, um, then you can do a glass cloche. There's also plastic ones you could create from a two liter soda bottle, just similar to this. And you can also try winter sewing, which is using a um, milk jug. So you could use the full size milk jug or the small size milk jug. Just make sure it's opaque, not the solid white like the orange juice jugs are because uh, you need sunlight to come in. All right, so just checking, right, giving myself a time check here. All right, and then the last way to stretch your cool season edibles and insulate them is with an old fashioned hot bed. And that's what our, our ancestors used. Um, and they were basically making a cold frame, except for they had layers of manure and layers of compost under the growing soil, and that created heat that came up into the beds, and so that was called hot beds. So that's how you can have heated beds outside without electricity um, in the winter time. All right, so the next thing I want to recommend, this is really for going fall into winter. Um, for, with your cool season, but any edible bed that you are not growing in at the moment should be covered with something. Um, otherwise, you're just inviting weeds and problems later on. So when you're pulling your summer crops and you don't plant out all your beds with cool season crops, then I recommend buying packs of cover crop seeds. Um, and I like a mix of winter oats and winter rye, but you could also try clover that this rabbit obviously adores. And daikon radish is also a, a fun one to use if you have really compacted clay soils. Daikon is a, a great thing to plant to, to break up that clay soil because it sends down a huge root and then you can just cut it off at the top and plant in that bed um, come springtime. All right, so when you're talking about uh, your cool season edible garden, one of the decisions you're gonna have to make is do I wanna direct sow the seeds? Do I wanna start the seeds early indoors? 
or do I want to buy already started seedlings? And Homestead has let me know that their seedlings are going to come in the store in about two weeks. So you can look out then for some of the seedlings I'll be talking about in a few minutes. But they already have these racks full of seeds. And I'm already noticing this card here and this card here. So this Diana took um, a couple days ago at the store. And these already mean that these categories are already sold out. And hopefully they'll be reordered and more are coming in. But that's telling you how fast the, the seeds are already selling at Homestead. Um, of course, starting from seed, a lot less expensive. And you get a lot more plants out of a seed pack than you would out of, say, a six pack of seedlings. It's also more convenient to grow from seed. And you get a lot more range of choices. So you have like tons of different squashes here instead of just maybe the one type of squash seedling that might be grown on and sold as, as seedling packs. So it's really up to you. I'll try to recommend for each of the plant categories we talk about whether I would start it from seed or seedling. Um, I'll just say that my general rule is I direct sow most everything for cool season crops except for the brassicas and we'll talk about them in a little bit. All right so Another um, discussion from going summer into the fall season, cool season, that you just want to store this away for later knowledge with the cover crop um, tip I gave you earlier, is that when you go from summer to fall, you're reversing spring um, instead of getting warmer and warmer and warmer soil and more and more sun every day. It's the opposite, obviously. It's getting cooler and you're getting shorter daylight. So when a seed pack says uh, that this radish germinates in three days and that you'll have radishes in 45 days, you need to add two weeks onto that when you're going from summer to fall cool season growing. Um, so, and I recommend that uh, when you're first starting seeds going into summer to fall, they need some type of shading or protection because these tiny seedlings are coming out usually when we still have 85, 90 degree days and full humidity. So I usually start seeding them um, under a board and then I li lift up the board and check on it every day or so. And as soon as I see the little seedlings start to emerge, I pull the board back and I put a row cover over, the, over them so they can continue growing. Um, so under the board, they stay damp and cool is basically what I'm doing. All right, so fall to winter, that's when we're gonna plant our onion and garlic. You can start planting your perennial edibles like asparagus and rhubarb. And then you can also plant some of the cold tolerant herbs like parsley, chives, and rosemary. It's not too late to do any of these now, uh, but that is something that you could have done back in October and November to give yourself a head start in the next growing season this year. So now we're at winter going into spring. Um, one of the ways we can speed up that soil temperature I talked about that's really important for seeds to germinate is by laying down black plastic across your beds and they have grower black plastic available. Um, you could also use construction grade um, black plastic bags that you cut open and pin down to the ground. Um, you can also try a winter sowing that I talked about earlier, which has the uh, seeds starting inside a mini greenhouse made out of milk chugs. And you can also start your sowing indoors to give you a head start. So most of the root vegetables and um, I was gonna say some of the, even some of the brassicas, you can start them indoors, but they don't love to be transplanted. So I'll tell you which ones definitely don't transplant <laughs> very well. Um, but the rest, again, I just direct so into the soil immediately out in the garden or in a container. All right, so this time of year is also fun to start um, foraging. So you can go with a mushroom guide, a mushroom expert, never go alone, if, <laughs> unless you are a mushroom expert yourself. They also sell now mushroom kits that you can grow and have mushrooms in your own kitchen. And then you know exactly what mushrooms you're growing. Um, usually it's oyster type. And you can also be collecting the first of the dandelion greens because they're tender and not so bitter when they're first emerging now. And then there's also wild leeks and fiddlehead ferns that you can start gathering um, out in your garden or on your walks to add to a little salad. 
And I think I'm going to use this for the break time. And good, we're just at 7.30, so doing a quick time check. And let's see, Audrey, I can see the Q&A. So let's see, I see Anonymous says, is pressure treated okay to use around a raised bed? I hear it is a better process now. Yes, so if it has been manufactured in the last five to 10 years, that wood is generally safer uh, to grow in. So you don't wanna go to say a reclaimed lumber yard or take lumber from an old building and create a bed from it. Uh, but the new pressure treated are, don't have that copper in it and the rest of the um, contaminants that were a worry before. So much better now. I prefer cedar because it's longer lasting and it's all natural. So it's a little more expensive to do cedar, but it's, it's nicer to start off that way. Um, let's see, Margaret says, do you, do you worry about plastic pots leaching chemicals? I, ha I don't. Um, usually you're rinsing them out and you're planting directly into potting soil. Um, and usually that is not gonna leach anything from the container itself. You could have a soil test done if you were really worried about it, um, but I haven't found that to be um, any worry in any of the research papers that I've read about container growing. Okay, and should you only use leaf grow in the fall as well, or was that just for the manure? So Jean asks, you can top dress and add leaf grow anytime. So um, it doesn't have that high nitrogen um, formula that animal manures do. So I will add a leaf manure after I plant up my seedlings. So if I buy a, bunch, a packet of broccoli seedlings and put them in the garden, I might add a handful of leaf grow into each planting hole with them. And then once I have them settled, after a week or so, I might come in and top dress around them with leaf grow or another chopped up organic material like pine needles or pine fines or something else just to add nutrients to the garden and also to keep the weeds down. Um, so you can add those anytime. Um, and then Catherine asks, why is cow and horse manure not recommended for compost? Uh, because um, they are much higher in nitrogen. So they found that it's most people won't wait the six months <laughs> that you need to wait for it to mellow out. And there's also been recently a lot of cases where um, cows and horses are eating contaminated hay that have weed killer in them, like glyphosate. And that is being obviously goes through your system, gets pooped out in their manure, and then you're top dressing your garden basically with a weed killer that kills everything in it. So um that's why there's so much caution about it unless you raise the horses and you knew what they ate and you knew their whole system or you were a friend maybe of the hor the horse owner and could know for sure i would err on the side of caution and stick with the bagged um, there's cockadoo to do and there's a few other um bagged aged amon manures that you can purchase that have been rated and tested so i find those much more reliable um, Kathy, we do have yeah. like a couple more. So we have one okay. from Melissa Bannett um, and she says, hi, Kathy, I'm in the plot next to you in the Fenton garden. How do I sow and grow lettuce now? And how do I keep the rabbits away? Uh, well, we will, at the end, we'll talk about um, pests <laughs> if we have time. And I will be talking about lettuce shortly in the next session. Okay, and then I also have a few from Facebook. So one wants to, one person wants to know what cool season vegetables work on a trellis, peas, and can they also do tomatoes on that same type of trellis? Yeah, so you can transition. You could start in the cool season with peas or fava beans uh, is your other cool season trellis uh, plant that you can grow. Um, and then you could either transition to beans or squash or tomatoes on that trellis into the, the warm season. Okay, and then the final question is, it's, sorry, it's fall, it's fall to winter when you're supposed to plant onions and garlic, but why are we getting the bulbs in now? Um, 
that's just you would have got a head start on it so and that's something you know because it's so busy in the early spring getting everything prepared and doing something else that's one of the things i just recommend to do as a head start so when you put bulb garlic or seed set onions in in the late fall they basically just sit for the winter they're not doing too much they might send out a little bit of foliage uh, but they're sitting in place and they're waiting again for the soil temperatures to warm up and then they take off. Um, so you just have that um, task off your list in advance. And they sell um, seed garlic and seed sets of onions both in the fall and the spring. So it's available at both times. All right, All right anything yeah, else? Yeah. That is all we've got. Okay, anything else for Facebook? All right, so we'll catch up on more at the end as well. And I was gonna say, this is some uh, compost tea that I brewed that's in the picture there, so don't drink that. <laughs> but it does look yummy, doesn't it? All right, so let me jump back into the PowerPoint. There we go. So now we're gonna talk about what we can grow in the cool season. Um, so we can grow some of the more hardy herbs um so herbs like basil um you're gonna wait want to wait till the temperatures are warm enough in may and june to grow basil but um you can certainly start from seed or cutting or buy seedling plants of the mediterranean herbs like sages rosemary and thyme um, they're perfectly hardy in our area and will winter over and come back year after year for you and this is I was just showing uh, one woman's little small herb garden that she created. And I love the way she sunk the um, containers into the soil. And that way you can keep control because sometimes herbs, especially like mint, <laughs> like to take over your whole garden. And you'll notice here that she's using a cloche over one of the more tender herbs um, that is more a warm season herb. So since it's a little cool season when I took this picture. So the next set of herbs that you can start from seed now um, include parsley, cilantro, and chives. Um, and I've been finding in the last few pretty mild winters that I'm getting parsley to winter over and come back that I've um, seeded in the fall and then comes back in the spring again for me. And then usually by the heat and humidity of the summer, it kind of just melts away. Same thing with cilantro, but cilantro uh the seeds of cilantro are coriander so you do want to let your cilantro get exposed to the heat and humidity send up those flower shoots form flowers and then seeds and then collect those wonderful seeds to plant cilantro next year and also to have coriander for your herbal use and then chives are probably the easiest of the herbs to grow these are really easy to seed into containers and they're kind of just like the cut and come again lettuce that you can just keep cutting a section and it'll come back up for you or cut another section it will come back up. Um, whereas parsley and cilantro i'm just going to selectively cut areas and maybe it'll come back, depending on the weather, depending on how mild it is, maybe it won't come back. Um, so those are I think the easiest ones to start from seeds and these are some of the seed packs that are available at homestead and down here you see the, the chives. Um, and some of the herbs over here. Okay, and then we did talk a little bit about, I repeated chives on here just because it is in the onion and garlic family. Um, these could be planted out now, probably as soon as the soil can be worked for the garlic and the, the onion seed sets um, because you want them to develop right away and then be able to harvest them in early summer. All right, so perennial edibles, um, asparagus, rhubarb, and Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, of these three, I would recommend asparagus to get started on as soon as you can. So you'll see it like in the, sm in the small box along with the bulbs and it'll just be sections of roots. It'll look like, like a teeny little tree with roots on it. Um, so you're gonna dig a, a little shallow trench and set those little roots down in a row and then bury that trench back. And then it's going to grow up with these little like looking like fiddleheads and you're not going to pick them. <laughs> you're not going to eat them. You're going to let them grow up. They're going to grow up into tall plants by the end of the growing season in, in September. And they'll look like these ferny tall little um, trees. But when they turn brown in October, November, then you'll cut them back. And you're going to let this process go for three years. 
And then the third year, when these first new little shoots come out of the ground in spring, then you're going to be able to harvest them. So why do we do that? Because you want the strength of the plant to be gathered every year from that foliage sent back down to the roots and then new shoots come up every year. Um, if you were to harvest the first year, the roots wouldn't get enough energy to come up the second year. If you harvested the second year, probably you would get a few weak shoots the next year, the third year, but not much. So you're doing this process of three years to get those roots nice and strong so you can have that third or fourth year harvest. And from then on, year after year, you'll have a great strong asparagus harvest. And yes, I know <laughs> it takes a lot of patience and you really want to eat those tender greens. Um, but just know that with asparagus, it's a perennial crop. Um, and you'll just have to have a bit of patience and set that section aside of your garden just for perennials every year. And that's why I also have a big giant asterisk next to Jerusalem artichoke. So Jerusalem artichokes are a tuber similar to say a potato. Um, so you'll just plant a few of those tubers and it comes up, it's in the sunflower family. So you get a nice, beautiful, small sunflower looking plant. And when that st starts to die back, you can go and dig out the tubers and you don't have to wait one, two or three years for Jeru Jerusalem artichokes. The tubers expand exponentially. <laughs> so you are gonna wanna keep on top of digging those Jerusalem artichokes out every year or your entire plot is gonna be Jerusalem artichokes. And that's why I have the big asterisks in the warning. Um, so what some people do at community gardens and other shared gardens is they put a plot back and off to one side that has a metal barrier in the ground. And that's the Jerusalem artichoke area that everybody is allowed to grow and dig from. Um, because if you mix it in with your other beds, it is a prolific plant. It's native to our area and it's super happy to grow in our soils. And you'll have tons of Jerusalem artichoke tubers um, coming, but you also will notice that it grows kind of like bamboo. It kind of takes over the world. So that's my big warning for you. They're yummy, they're good, they're super easy to grow, but they can be monsters. All right, so next on our root vegetables, um, radish and carrots, I always recommend planting together. So you'll see um, in the homestead racks here, we've got carrots here and we've got radishes here. So even if you hate radish, even if you hate carrots, I want you to plant them together at the same time. And I'm gonna tell you why. So you're gonna do one little row of radish, one little row of carrots, one little row of radish. So alternate rows of radish, carrot, radish, carrot, four to six inches apart and you are going to see the radish germinate within a matter of days. Like three to five days later, you'll have tiny little radish seedlings. The carrots are not gonna germinate for you for several weeks. And you're gonna say, I'm giving up on these carrots. Carrots are not gonna grow for me. But what's gonna happen is when the radish are finally up and showing their red so shoulders and are ready to be harvested, that's when the carrots are finally going to germinate and you're going to see tiny little carrot seedlings growing. So the radishes are a great marker to tell you, don't plant in this area, have faith, the carrots are coming, but the radishes can be grown and harvested while the carrot is just starting out and starting to grow. And then you harvest your radish and let the carrots take over the rest of the area. Um, and carrots can be harvested at any time from tiny stage, like baby carrots, all the way to full grown. Um, so just warning that carrots do take weeks to months to um, develop. So you might want to get some at the baby stage and maybe plant extra um, just to know they will take a long time. Um, so that was my radish and carrot pairing. <laughs> so our next to root vegetables are uh, seed potatoes. So we can do a mound or a container with the seed potatoes at the bottom. Then you're gonna mound soil up. The plants are gonna come up. And once the plants are about, mm, I would say eight inches to 12 inches high, you're gonna mound more soil on top and bury that stalk. And then you're gonna leave a little bit of of the leaves showing on the top. Don't bury the entire plant. My brother did that and he did not have potatoes. So you're gonna bury 
up to about four inches from the top. Then you're going to lift that girl up and you're going to bury it again. So wherever it, the soil is buried on the stem, it's going to send out roots and form tubers. So you're going to have two or three times the amount of potatoes on that plant than if you had just planted it straight in the soil and let the plant grow up. Um, so there are potato sacks available specifically for this. If you want, you don't want to keep mounding and mounding and mounding on your raised beds, um, you can grow it in what's called a potato sack, like those um, fabric cloth sacks we showed you earlier. And they even have like the little pins on the on the side with a drop down drawer, so you can reach in and take out some of those potatoes, put it back up and not have to dump out the entire potato plant um, just to get a couple potatoes. So that's a fun way to, to introduce kids to gardening too, is to start off with some of these seed potatoes because they're really prolific and, and it's really nice um, to just plant say six potatoes in a, a box there and then come back in several months and have a couple dozen per plant. So it's nice to see that progression. All right, so for turnips, beets, and kohlrabi, those I direct sow from seed, from seed packs. They are not quite as slow as carrots, but they're not quite as fast as radish. So they're kind of the in-between uh, radish and, and carrots for time-wise. You usually will get them to germinate pretty quickly, but it does take them a few months to develop. And my caution on the those root vegetables is to give them enough space. So I notice when people seed, uh, especially beets and turnips, they put like the seed pack will say, put one seed every four inches or so, and they'll put one seed every inch. <laughs> so obey the seed pack spacing because those beets and turnips do get big and you don't want to crowd them and need to thin them later on. All right, so lettuce and salad greens. This is one of the most rewarding and easiest of your cool season edibles. Um, so you can do lettuce, arugula, which is right here in my plot here under the cover cloth, spinach, Swiss chard, kale and collards. Kale and collards, you can grow all of these directly from seed, but you can also buy started uh, six packs of the Swiss chard, kale and collards if you like. And then a lot of the Asian greens prefer the cool temperatures rather than the heat and humidity of our summers. So you can try out mustard, mustard mizuno, tatsoi, or pak choy, and loose leaf Chinese cabbages. And notice here, I have my cover cloth that I've pulled back to show you the arugula and to show you the baby kale. And I put the cover cloth right back over. It makes my garden plot look like I have a bunch of ghosts living there, <laughs> but I have a bunch of greens under those cover cloths. And that's not just for insulation. That's because of white fly and other insect pests. Um, so the white fly and other insect, insect pests especially are a problem for the kale and collards. Um, so I keep the cover cloth pretty much over them 24 seven, unless I am um, weeding around them or harvesting them. All right, so let's go on to the brassica family, which um, kale and cabbages and collards are. So brassicas are basically all the same plant, but they've just been bred over the years for the different parts for harvesting. So broccoli, you're eating the flower head um, and kale, you're eating the leaves. So basically think of, of them all as the same plant, just in various different stages and various different emphasis of what part of the plant you want. And then of course, turnips, you're eating the bottoms of. Um, so all of these are uh, long season plants. So you want to get a head start on these by either starting them on grow lights indoors from seed now, or you can buy started seedlings. And that's what I do for my broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts because they take so long um, to germinate. And then by the time you have a nice sized broccoli plant, that's when the heat and humidity in late May and early June come on and they just zap the energy of your plants and then they go bitter and they bolt. Um, and then the same thing happens in the fall. You wanna get started with indoor seedling trays or started seedlings of the brassicas and then plant them out in early September 
so you can harvest them by Thanksgiving time. Um, so brassicas for the mid-Atlantic are, are, I don't want to say heartbreaking, <laughs> but they are one of the harder edibles to grow. Um, so if you have issues with it, if you've had um, uh, trouble getting especially Brussels sprouts to develop those nice little heads by the time winter frosts and freezes come in, you're not alone. It is tough for us because we get so hot so fast at the end of May and then we cool down so gradually in September October and we even have 90 degrees days in October that these just really don't get much of a head start for us so they are one of the harder to do but they are rewarding um I would say for the effort that I put into my broccoli and how much I've tried to grow them, I might as well have just bought them at a grocery store, but I still want to grow my own food and still want to try it out. All right, so uh, somebody asked earlier about trellis growing edibles and I highly recommend, pea, recommend peas and fava beans are fun to try if you're going to eat them. They're just fun to play with if you're not going to eat them but peas are one of the easiest to grow. And I, I personally like um, not the shelling peas, but the pod peas, like the snow, the snow peas. And you can eat the tender pea tendrils and greens as well. Um, so you don't even have to wait for the peas to form. So those I usually soak a couple hours when I buy a pack of, of pea seeds from the store soak them in a cup of water for a couple hours and then plant them right at the base of each trellis where I want them to climb. And then I might put like a, a row cover or a little bit of screening around them because of those bunnies that I was asked about before, um, because those tender pea shoots are so yummy. <laughs> and that I've found that not only the rabbits like to eat those pea shoots just as they start to emerge, but so do the caterpillars, so do the slugs, and so do birds. I've caught robins going into my plot and plucking those little tender pea shoots out as well. So I, I now make like a little um, chicken wire cage that I put around the, the pea shoots as they're emerging. And then when they grow up, I pull back the little wire cage from around them. Um, and again, you can also use row cover to cover them and pin the row cover down around it. So animals and insects don't get to those tender pea shoots. Um, so you can do peas in the, that's my five minute warning everybody, <laughs> peas in the springtime and in the fall. If you're gonna start them in the fall, I would say start them by the end of August, early September so that you get a harvest by November. Um, in um, the springtime now, I'm going, I'm planning on doing a set, uh, the traditional planting time around St. Patrick's Day last year because it was such a mild winter that we had last year I actually started my peas on February 15th and I was harvesting and eating them by April 15th so that was a really different year that year that I could really chance it and be a month earlier but again every year is going to vary and you want to check the local soil temperatures and average air temperatures just to be able to see if you can cheat mother nature and go earlier and it seems like um, with our mild winters we are on the verge of being able to go earlier and earlier with those peas and have them before um, the heat of june sets in all right so i think we're coming to our wrap-up slides and then i'll take some final questions so for further reading and sources on local edibles, I recommend, of course, subscribing to Washington Gardener Magazine. Um, going on garden tours, um, there's a lot of edible garden and community garden tours being offered these days. Um, there's some good out of print gardening books. There was the Washington Star Garden Book and the Washington Post and the Montgomery Men's Garden Club has a nice garden digest size book. Uh, that's a good guide for beginning gardeners in our area. Um, visiting local public gardens. So even the U.S. Botanic Garden on the National Mall has a demonstration edible garden and an edible gardener there that you can talk to and pick their brains and get some ideas. I love the edible garden at Green Spring Gardens in Annandale, Virginia. That's a great one to visit and check out what they're growing. 
and then follow other local gardeners on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to see what they're growing. So you can exchange tips and say, I tried out this lettuce. How did that do for you? Or how about this radish? Which ones do you recommend? Um, and then swap some, maybe even seeds or, or stories between you. So really quickly, this is my contact information on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me at WDC Gardener. This is me with a giant pile of that leaf mulch growth <laughs> that I talked about earlier. On Facebook, you can follow me at Washington Gardener Magazine and website and blog are washingtongardener.com or washingtongardener.blogspot.com. And I mentioned our podcast at Garden DC. And if you enjoyed today's talk, I'd love for you to put a review on my page at greatgardenspeakers.com. You can just look up Kathy Jentz, J-E-N-T-Z, and put a review there. And that has my contact information as well on the Great Garden Speakers page. And I'll flip back to my contact page just in case I uh, went through that a little too fast. And then let's see on the Q&A session. Do you want session. me to read them off or do you want to? Um, I, I can go through the Q&A, but if you can tell me the Facebook or the other ones. Okay. Okay, let me go backwards on, ooh, I see a ton in the Q&A. <laughs> let's see if I can pull this up a little higher. Um, Joanna says, at what temp do you vent the cold frame and row cover? Basically any day that's gonna be over 45 degrees, then you would know. Um, they even sell these um, vent timers, so to speak. So they're just like, it looks like a little triangle that lifts up your cold frame. Um, so you would set it for like dawn to dusk and it would close it back down at night. That I would recommend if you were working nine to five outside your home or had really erratic work shifts. But now that a lot of us are home due to COVID, uh, I just feel like that just needs to be part of your morning routine is to check the weather. And if it's rainy and cold and cloudy for that day, you might just want to crack it a little bit. If it's sunny, then you definitely want to open up those cold frames and let those air out. Um, Joanna says, can you transplant asparagus? I planted some in a raised bed. Yes, you can transplant them, but they do need to settle in for a couple years before you can harvest again from them. So it doesn't set the clock all the way back to the beginning, but kind of. So I would still wait a couple years for that. Um, and what soil do you use in container gardening, says Darcy. So I recommended that on the shopping list. Um, there's a couple good uh, potting soil mixes. So you want to use a light potting soil mix and it's going to say potting mix. Um, it might even say for edibles. I don't recommend ones that have um, uh, fertilizer already in the mix or the soil moist pellets in the mix for edibles. Those I would use for growing ornamental plants and annuals. So you just want a straight potting mix without those additives in there and as opposed to garden soil. So if you see bags of gardening soil, those are for adding to raised beds, whereas potting mix is what you're gonna have in a container. All right, and then let's see, if starting seeds for brassicas inside, when do you plant outside? So you're gonna wait till they set like their second set of true leaves. So usually about um, six weeks or so of growth is probably a good rule of thumb for, for most of the brassicas. Um, you'll know when they start to put that second set of true leaves on there and then you'll do a hardening off process. You'll just set the seedling trays out for a couple hours every day and lengthen that over several days until um, they can go out for eight or 10 hours at a time and then you'll be able to plant them out. Um, Kim says, I planted beets late last summer to see if they would grow over the fall winter. Today, the leaves look very nice, but the root is short and slender. If I leave them in the ground, will they grow enough to form a rounded root? Yes. So here's a little known <laughs> secret about beets. Um, the greens on beets are the same greens that you're eating as Swiss chard. Uh, it's the same plant, just bred, like I said, with the brassicas for two different purposes. So the greens of Swiss chard are used as lettuce, like uh, harvest, and then the roots of the beets. So you can eat your beet greens. So even if your beets don't develop any bigger than those slender roots, you could still enjoy the, the greens if you want to. But I would say that once the soil warms up enough in the next few weeks, 
the roots will probably start to expand and grow for you and you'll have some decent sized beets by the end of the season. And I think I started in, in the middle of the question. So what time are you sowing lettuce in the spring? I am going to be starting my lettuce about the same time I start my peas, which is around March 15th to 20th. Um, let's see, Joanna's asking about asparagus again. Uh, I received plants from someone who started from seed and they grew the fern-like foliage you mentioned this year. Am I a year ahead or a year behind? I think you've got, you can count that as one year <laughs> once you've got that fern-like like foliage for one. And then Kathleen is asking about herbs. seeds like cilantro. Do you winter sow in containers or straight in the garden? Cilantro, I just plant straight out in the garden and that I do that for all my herbs. If it was a more tender herb, like say basil or something like that, then I might winter sow in a jug and give myself a head start, but I don't really see the need to at that point. Um, I just direct sow them and they come up very, very quickly. All right. So Audrey, uh, Facebook questions. Um, yes. So we did have one question that I think you got lost in the mix. So Kathy yep. Connolly was asking, should asparagus be fertilized? No, you don't need to fertilize it at all. Okay. And then you can top dress it. Well, I was going to say you can top dress it with a leaf grower or a little light top dressing with the animal manure in the fall, but that's all it would need. Okay, and then um, Linda Barrett wants to ask about um, broccoli rob. So is that included, I guess, in your brassicas that you could- Yeah, so that's just another um, cross they, that they've done with the brassica family. So it's all the same genetically. It's very funny. It's all genetically the same plant, uh, but just um, bred for different features. And the broccoli rob is a more leafy type of broccoli. Um, and it's a little quicker growing because you don't have to form those whole flower heads. So it, that one's a good one uh, for beginners and the brassicas to, to go for. Awesome. And then um, Margaret Loomis, I can answer this question, said yep. she didn't get the handouts on the shopping list. Um, but yes, we are planning to send out a follow-up email with those um, Great. shopping list and handout again. And then um, we have a question about when to grow cilantro and how not to make it bulk. Yeah, you're not going to be able to stop it from bolting, <laughs> except for the cover cloth, I find gives me about another week. So say it's May 15th, May 20th, and we have an 85 degree day, and that's going to send the cilantro uh, into bolting. It's going to give a, a signal that it's hot now, I need to produce those flowers and seeds. So with a reme or the cover cloth over it, it's partially shaded. And it keeps it a little cooler, so I can usually get another week or so out of that cilantro. But eventually, I'm going to pull that cover cloth off and let it go again to to bolt. It's just gonna it's just part of the process here. Um, and I'm going to collect those seeds because again, that's coriander, and then I'll have seeds to plant in the fall for that. But cilantro is is tough for our area, just like the brassicas are, because we do have short shoulder seasons and hot days and hot nights. If we had hot days with cool nights, we might be able to get that uh, cilantro and some of the, the brassicas to last a little longer for us, but that's just how our weather patterns are in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and then they want to know um, recommendations for frequency of watering in cool weather. So that's the one great thing <laughs> about our cool season is we usually have pretty regular rains. So very rarely do I have to go in and water because um, it's spring is kind of our ra rainy season for us. Um, usually what I do is when you first direct sow or you first transplant those seedlings into the soil, then you're going to give the soil a good drink um, and then top dress it to keep some of that moisture in the soil. If it doesn't rain for a period of say five to seven days, then I might add a little more water to the seedlings, the established plants. For seeds like carrot seeds or radish seeds, I will usually just give them a little dribble of water every two or three days. But usually I'll stick my finger in the soil and if the soil feels cold and moist, I might not even do that for fear that I would rot the seeds out because our springtime stays pretty cold and damp for a long time for usually March into April when the seedlings are just coming up. Once the seedlings have emerged, 
then you just need to water about once a week if it hasn't rained. Um, so if we've had a good half inch or inch of rain and I have a rain gauge or you can just check the weather websites to know if it if your area really got enough rain for that. But knock on wood that we don't have a drought and that we're usually pretty good for, for rain in the springtime. Okay, and then I have four more questions. Uh -huh. um, so just let me know when we got to start cutting it off. Um, yeah, so we'll take these four and then we'll cut it off. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at the time now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What about a late snow around Easter? Should we be worried um, about that? What precautions? So that's when you can do some of the insulation uh, techniques I showed you, like the cloche or throwing a plastic uh, soda bottle with the bottom cut off over it. And the cover cloths are usually enough for, I find. Um, you could always throw an old sheet, cotton sheet or something on top too, and then pull that back. Um, most of the cool season crops I just showed you are perfectly used to an occasional snow dusting. Now, if we got like four to six inches of snow and it lasted for days, that might injure some of the seedlings. But almost all of the crops I showed you are used to our drops and increases in temperatures throughout the springtime. Awesome. Um, Joanna Kearns um, is asking, I'm trying the winter sowing this year and want to know how long the seedlings can last in the jugs for summer squash, et cetera. So they're gonna start wanting to come out. <laughs> They'll like start poking almost their way out of the, the jugs pretty soon when they start to outgrow them. And you're gonna wanna transplant them into seedling pots and then give them protection like in a cold frame or under, under a row cover because those are warm season plants, the squashes, they, they definitely are gonna need extra protection until you can actually plant them out in the garden um, after about mid-April or so. Okay, um, Catherine Lambert would like to know what mix do you recommend for overwintering herbs in pots? Um, I, see, I assume she means soil mix, maybe. I'm going to guess yes. Okay, so in that case, I'm just using a, a for the Mediterranean herbs. I'll even use a cactus and succulent mix just because it has better drainage um, than a lot of our regular potting mixes do that have a lot of peat in them. Um, so that's for the Mediterranean hardy herbs like um, rosemary and sage. So you definitely want something that's really well draining. Um, because the enemy of the rosemary and sage overwintering is not our cold temperatures. They can take the cold. What they can't take is sitting in our winter wet and the roots rotting. So that's why I recommend a, like planting them in a terracotta pot with really good, well-draining soil. All right, awesome. Um, and then the final question is from Kim Dumming. Is leaf grow a compost or is it a mulch that I can spread to an inch thickness over the entire flower garden? Yeah, it's kind of confusing because it's both. <laughs> so it's partially composted leaves. So what it is, is they take our leaves up, you know, that are left on the curb, they shred them up and then they mound them um, in a field and then they put a big plastic covering over them. And I went to go see the leaf grow uh, uh, operation last year and it was so fun to see the process. And then they shred them up, they take them out of one pile, shred them up again, mix them up, put them in a second pile. So it goes through three piles and then they get filtered. Um, so any sticks or any pieces uh, of big debris will be out of it. So you'll notice they're partially composted. They're composted from three to six months, depending on um, the crop that you get, but it's usually a six month process from one to two to three piles. Um, so you can do the same thing at home with your own leaves. It's a little bit of work, of course, and you might not have the space and room for that, which is why I recommend purchasing the leaf grow. And so it makes a great top dressing and it works its way into the soil um kind of by magic it's the soil microbes and worms and things coming up eating the leaves and bringing that good nutrient down into the soil so you can just top dress around your plants and it works its way in eventually or as you're planting as i recommended before putting a handful in the planting hole as well and that is all <laughs> yay 
<laughs> so if we didn't get to any of your questions, um, I will check the Facebook page later as well and try to go back in and answer some questions if, if there wasn't anything that we missed there and um, find me on social media and feel free to ask me questions there on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and also share pictures with me. We want to see what you're growing and we want to see what ones you loved, like if there was a particular carrot or a particular radish or, or maybe one of those blue potatoes that you really were like surprised and thought was super yummy. And so our next talk is going to be on container gardening, I believe, and that's the first Wednesday of April. All right, I was just going to check the date for you. I think that is April 7th. We want to make sure I have the right and it's April 7th at 7 p.m. And I think that Homestead will be putting up the link for that registration in the next couple of weeks. Oh, we already have it up and oh, great. Uh, people should go on and register as soon as possible because we are filling up and we can only have a hundred people max in ah. the registered. So, and after that, you'll have to watch on Facebook. Okay, great. And I was going to say that that container gardening talk is mainly ornamental containers, but I will talk a little bit more about edible container growing in that talk as well.